The James Webb Telescope is about to finally launch, but it's not in the clear quite yet. Before we have a fully functioning telescope, the JWST must brave 30 days of space with zero margins for error. The ongoing saga of the telescope is a quarter of a century old. However, in all its years of development, its biggest challenge still lies ahead of it. Optimized for infrared wavelengths to complement and extend the discoveries of the Hubble telescope, Webb had as many as 2,000 scientists and technicians working on it at once. In total, 10,000 people were involved in its construction over the decades. A true testament to what like-minded humanity is capable of. Thanks to its design, it will have more extended wavelength coverage and greater sensitivity than any other telescope man has ever created. The longer wavelengths enable Webb to look further back in time, to find the first galaxies that formed in the early universe, and to peer inside dust clouds where stars and planetary systems are forming today. Preparing for the adventure So, let's get the good news out of the way first. The JWST launch date has been confirmed to be December 18. Despite all the delays in the past, it seems like this launch date is set in stone. No more delays, no more name changes, we are in the end game now. The telescope was shipped in a specially built French vessel named MN Calibri. Designed to transport aerospace components, with the telescope inside a watertight chamber, a specialized freight company oversaw the transport, beginning with moving the container and telescope from Northrop Grumman's facilities through Southern California's freeway system to the ship docked by Huntington Beach, CA. The massive clean air chamber was built so the telescope would not be exposed to vibrations, any excessive g-forces of acceleration and deceleration, the rolling and pitching on the water due to sea swell or wind, or excessive temperatures. The 9,300-kilometer sea voyage took Webb from California through the Panama Canal to Port du Paria Cabo on the Kura River in French Guiana, out to the southeastern coast of South America. After a very long 16-day transport by sea, the telescope successfully reached French Guiana on October 13. From there, it was a very short drive to the ESA spaceport in Kourou. It's important to note that this was all done in secrecy to avoid any tempted pirates. JWST is now at the payload processing facility, where staff will start the process of getting the telescope into the Ariane 5 rocket fairing. The next two weeks will be full of performance tests to verify that the transport has not caused damage. Once it has been confirmed that the JWST is still fully functional, it will be meticulously put into the Ariane 5 rocket for launch. In fact, during the entirety of the project, the specifications of the rocket's capabilities were paramount in the design of Webb. Inside the rocket, the available volume has a diameter of 4.6 meters and a height of 16.2 meters. And all measurements, both of the cargo bay and the telescope, were calculated to the centimeter. A week before launch, the telescope will be placed inside the rocker and its fairings will be positioned. On the last day before launch, the rocket itself will finally be positioned onto the launch pad. From there, the great journey of the JWST will finally commence. Launch Day Decades of planning and thousands of people's hard work have led us to this moment. Double checking, triple checking, meticulously examining every component to the centimeter. There are zero margins for error. And with the greatest minds in the world working on this project, you would think that they can initiate launch with 100% certainty. But that is not the case. If rocket science has taught us anything, it is that something can always go wrong. It only takes a single moment for catastrophe to strike, whether it be on the launch pad or on its journey through space. We cannot control everything that happens, although we may try. Presuming no further delays in its path to the launch pad, early in the morning of December 18, Webb will blast off with a slight eastward trajectory over the Atlantic. The rocket will provide thrust for roughly 26 minutes after letoff. Moments after the second stage, engine is cut off. Webb will separate from the Ariane 5 and begin to drift into space, beginning its journey. To get to the Lagrangian point, L2, 1.5 million miles from Earth, 50 deployments 
have to occur without a hedge. More so, there are 344 single point failures that have to cohesively deploy. The separation from the rocket will trigger the solar array to deploy within minutes so that Webb can start making electricity from the sun rays. Webb will quickly establish its ability to orient itself and fly in space. Although the solar array deployment is a relatively simple procedure, its success is critical to power all following operations. About 12 hours after launch, the craft's thrusters will fire for the first time to correct its trajectory. Course corrections must be efficient to preserve the telescope's fuel and maximize its lifespan. Confirmation for a successful course correction will not arrive until well after the fact, although subsequent tweaks to Webb's flight trajectory can be made if needed. 30 days After three days in space, Webb will begin to deploy one of its most intricate and prominent components, the Sun Shield. Arguably, the most important part of the telescope the sun shield will ensure that zero light pollution from the sun or reflection of the sun from Earth and its moon reach the telescope and interfere with its infrared vision. A stack of five enormous kite-shaped sheets of polyamide film will block sunlight and heat from reaching the telescope's infrared sensors, which must remain at extremely low cryogenic temperatures to function properly. The sun shield is crucial for keeping the telescope sufficiently cold. In order to open it, 150 release mechanisms must fire off correctly over the course of three days. The complicated deployment involves around 7,000 parts, including 400 pulleys, 8 motors, and 140 release actuators. Without the sun shield, the entire premise of the telescope will be mute. The entire point of the JWST was to be able to view the stars unhindered by the light pollution of the sun. If it fails, the infrared camera of the telescope will drastically reduce effectiveness. It is the key to achieving scientists' wildest dreams, but for the aerospace engineers, the procedure's complexity and the high number of single-point failures are the stuff of nightmares. It will be a challenge to ensure that these five extremely thin layers, more than 20 meters long, unfold perfectly, keeping the right separation from each other. However, the tension does not end there. The next step will be the separation between the spacecraft bus and telescope by extending the telescoping tower between them. The tower will have to extend about 2 meters, allowing the rest of the sun shield deployment to commence. Next, the sun shield membranes will be unpinned, and the telescoping sun shield mid booms will extend. First the port side and then the starboard side, pulling the membranes out with them. The last sun shield deployment step is tensioning of the membranes. In the meantime, other things like radiators will be released and deployed. During the second week after launch, it will finish deploying the telescope structures by unfolding and latching the secondary mirror tripod and rotating and latching the two primary mirror wings. Note that the telescope and scientific instruments will start to cool rapidly in the shade of the sun shield but it will take several weeks for them to cool all the way down and reach stable temperatures. This cool-down will be carefully controlled with strategically placed electric heater strips so that everything shrinks carefully and so that water trapped inside parts of the observatory can escape as gas to the vacuum of space and not freeze as ice onto the mirrors or detectors, which would degrade scientific performance. All segments of the primary and secondary mirrors will be unlocked and their mobility will be verified. The telescope's secondary mirror, positioned at the end of three long arms, will lower into place. Despite its name, the secondary mirror is actually a very critical component for Webb's success. If other deployments do not work out perfectly, there may be workarounds. But if the secondary mirror doesn't deploy successfully, we lose everything. Near the end of the first month of the mission, there will be the last mid-course maneuver to insert into the optimum orbit around L2. During this time, it will also power up the scientific instrument systems. Finally, a month after launch, Webb should reach L2, concluding one of the most expensive and nerve-wracking spaceflights ever attempted. The remaining five months of commissioning will be all about aligning the optics and calibrating the scientific instruments. The final stretch. In the second, 
third and fourth months, Webb will try to point at a single bright star and demonstrate that the observatory can acquire and lock onto targets. But because the primary mirror segments have yet to be aligned to work as a single mirror, there will be up to 18 distorted images of the same target star. The long alignment process of all telescope optics will then be initiated, beginning with identifying which primary mirror segment goes with which image by moving each segment one at a time and ending a few months later with all the segments aligned as one and the secondary mirror aligned optimally. In the fifth and sixth months, all the operating modes of scientific instruments will be meticulously calibrated, observing representative targets and the ability to track moving targets such as asteroids, comets, moons and planets in our solar system will be established. This will be followed by a phase called Early Release Observations, which will illustrate the imaging capabilities of the observatory. After six months, Webb will begin its science mission and start to conduct routine science operations. Another five months or so will be dedicated to early release science observations. Select astronomers will train with the telescope on a wide range of targets, from distant galaxies to planets in our own solar system, to gain experience with the nuances of this new instrument and share that knowledge with the rest of the astronomical community. I suppose you could call this a trial period for the JWST, since it has never been used before. It will require some familiarization with its pilots. Other early users will be called guaranteed time observers, people who have spent years of their lives planning and building this new telescope, and so will get the first crack at using it without having to compete for observing time. The JWST was designed primarily for deep space cosmology, but any telescope of this caliber does a little bit of everything and it will be called on to do virtually every kind of astronomical observation. If all goes well, in mid-January 2022, the telescope will be in position at the L2 point and fully operational, marking the beginning of a new scientific era. Who knows, perhaps the universe can finally unveil some of its secrets.